thanks for coming back for day two. I'm David Verrill. I'm the executive director of the Initiative on the Digital Economy, your co-host for day two of this fine event. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to go on the record as saying that I am a die-hard Boston Red Sox fan. However, uh, my nephew Jay Verrill, I, he needs a shout out. He's an MIT alum. He runs marketing analytics for the Houston Astros. And while it may be correlation rather than causality, I think MIT can take credit for the World Series victory last night. So we're, we're, we're going to get this morning rolling right away. And I'm very pleased to uh, bring up Eric Brynjolfsson. For those of you who were here yesterday, he needs no introduction, but I'll give a brief one for those of you who are new here today. He's a professor at the Sloan School. He is co-founder and director of the Initiative on the Digital Economy and one of the leading thought leaders on how technology is affecting uh, our economy. So Eric, get us rolling, please. Thanks, David. So what an amazing day yesterday. I, uh, I think most of you are here, and uh, I just found it uh, wonderful to hear so many uh, brilliant people. And one of the great things about being here at MIT is all the, the wonderful people who come here and are willing to share their thoughts, and all the people who, who work here, uh, some of the best technologists, some of the best economists and social scientists. And we'll be hearing from more of them today. And there are a couple of themes that came up yesterday uh, over and over. And I want to touch on both of those. Um, I guess you could broadly group them into optimism and pessimism. I mean, there were people who were very excited about all the great things that are happening. But we also heard a, a number of people, I see Moshe there, that, that pointed out there's some real concerns, some pessimism about robots eating the jobs and, and uh, how, what's going to happen to the people who are left behind. Today, I want to pick up on that a little bit. Um, in particular, I want to focus on an, an aspect of it, not the employment part, which we're going to talk a little bit more about later, but let me talk right now about the, the productivity part. And there again, there's been some optimism and pessimism. And, and I came across this uh, study uh, this week that I was very surprised, um, just about the, the pessimism. And this is the number of people in each country that think the world is getting better. And uh, China, as you can imagine from hearing from Kai-Fu Lee yesterday, is at the top of the list. And, uh, almost half the people think the world is getting better. I was amazed to see the United States all the way down there at 6%. 6% of the people in America think the world is getting better. Uh, that by itself is a pretty pessimistic statistic that so many people feel like things aren't working for them. And, and there's another survey that um, a majority of Americans think that this is the worst time in, human history, in, in American history. So um, that's 6%. I, I don't know exactly how many that works out to be, but, but I suspect if you, if you took out the people in this auditorium, it might be down to 5% or 4%, because I think a big chunk of them are here. Um, so that is, is an interesting stat. And it, there's some uh, evidence behind it when you look at what's happening to economic growth and productivity. Um, we had this golden era of productivity growth between 1947 and 73, and, and Bob Gordon and Joel and, and Adorona and I are going to talk about that in a little while. Um, and then starting in 1973, things didn't do, go so well. There was the oil shock, and there were some other, I think, kind of inexplicable slowdowns in productivity. Uh, Macroeconomists have been studying and debating this for, for 40 or 50 years, and I don't think they've fully understood what's behind it. As you go from business cycle to business cycle, and by the way, these time periods are, aren't picked arbitrarily. They're picked from the peak of one business cycle to the peak of the next business cycle so you to try to take out some of the, the cyclical effects in productivity. We had some gradual improvement. And in, in fact, the late 1990s and the early 2000s, things were looking pretty good. Um, many people, including me, pointed to the information technology revolution. Things were improving quite a bit. Um, but then, since then, the latest business cycle has once again been kind of disappointing uh, from, since 2007. And if you continue it out, you'd still continue to get pretty low productivity growth. And I think this is the basis, either explicitly or implicitly, behind a lot of the, the pessimism that we aren't growing as fast as we used to. And, and although Paul Krugman once said, productivity isn't everything, but in the long run, it's almost everything, um, I think that's one of the, the main drivers of raising living standards, making the pie bigger so we have more wealth to share and more resources to devote towards uh, improving health care, uh, education, uh, 
food and, and, and eliminating poverty and, and a lot of other pressing needs that we have. Um, and that has spilled over into this question, um, inspired again, I think, by Bob Gordon's research, from you'll hear from in, in a minute, um, about whether or not we're sort of running out of inventions. We're all the great inventions in the past, and it's not a coincidence that this guy is sitting on a, on a toilet, because that was certainly one of the great inventions in human history. Most of us wouldn't want to have, have to give that up, even if, uh, even if it meant that we had more smartphones. So there were some amazing inventions in the past, and, and, and there's a real ongoing debate, which we'll, we'll dive into, about whether there are equally important inventions in our future. But I don't want to just talk about the pessimism, because there's also a lot of optimism. And you heard that yesterday. Um, I mentioned Kai Fu Li and, and his optimism and about what's happening uh, in China, but in artificial intelligence generally. Um, Eric Schmidt was very optimistic yesterday. But there's a whole litany of people um, that are, most of them very close to the technology, that are really impressed with what's happening now and uh, couldn't be more optimistic. And what's the basis of that? Well, Part of it is that machine learning has gotten a lot better. I want to note that we're going to have some muffins at the break. And I just want you to be real careful about which ones you reach for there. Um, and um, um, humans you know, are pretty good at recognizing objects. And historically, that's been one of the many things that we could do that machines couldn't do. But that's changed. Over the past uh, 10, 15 years or so, um, machine vision has improved dramatically. So this is uh, scoring on a, a big database called ImageNet, about 14 million images. And if you uh, look at those images, um, humans do pretty good. They get about 95% of them correct. It's about a 5% error rate. Um, it hasn't improved much. The yellow line is pretty flat. Humans are about the same at recognizing objects as they ever have been. But machines have gotten much, much better. And that, Acceleration there is due to our friend Jan Kuhn, who spoke yesterday, and other people like Jeff Hinton, who have helped develop these neural nets. And when the deep neural net approach was applied to image recognition, there was a, a very noticeable improvement in performance. And so as you can see now, the blue line is a little below the yellow line, meaning that we've crossed a really important threshold where machines for certain applications can recognize faces, objects, images better than humans. I mean, I played around with some of the image net. There are dozens of different species of dogs and birds there. I have to admit, I don't know how to recognize all those different kinds of dogs and birds, but, but the machine does. It can do it. So um, that progress continues. And it's not just in vision. We see similar things in voice recognition. Um, dramatic improvement, almost a doubling in the accuracy. And you guys have your own sense. You know that if you, if you talk to Siri or Google Home, it's far from perfect. But we're kind of in this 10-year period where we went from machines mostly not being able to understand what humans say to being you know, kind of passably good. Here, the progress has been even faster. This is not over the past 10 or 15 years. This is over the past year that we've had this kind of progress. Again, mostly driven by these machine learning systems. And then you can apply them to diagnosing cancer. Um, and there was a paper recently published in Nature by Sebastian Thrun and some of his colleagues that compared machine systems for recognizing uh, cancer and dermatology applications to a set of human, board-certified dermatologists. And the machines did just as well, if not better, than the humans did at that application. And I could go through lots of others. You've heard some of them. So that's a cause for some optimism. And looking forward, I'd be even more optimistic. We're having a flood of research. Um, we've had a 10x increase in the number of people working on these kinds of applications. And I have to think that some of them are going to continue to make the kind of breakthroughs like the ones I just showed you a minute ago. So what's going on here? How do we, why do we have this, this clash of pessimists and optimists? Um, in a paper with Chad Severson and Daniel Rock that we just came out this week, we described four possible explanations for this. Um, maybe, maybe the optimists are just wrong. That's one possibility. Um, it's happened before. People had great expectations and things didn't pan out. Another possibility is that we're mismeasuring things, that these benefits aren't being captured in our productivity and GDP statistics. And there's good evidence that that, that, that has some truth. Another one is that maybe their benefits are all being captured by a relatively small group of people, the 1% or the 1% of the 1%, and, and that's why we're not uh, seeing the returns to most people. And the last one is the one I want to emphasize, which is that 
this restructuring takes time. The technology is amazing, but one of the reasons we had this conference is to bring together technologists and social scientists and managers. And history tells us that when these great breakthroughs in technology happen, they don't instantly get translated into economic benefit. If you look back at electricity or the steam engine or the internal combustion engine, they all took decades to play out. And so these implementation and structuring lags are quite real. And that means that, in my view, the AI productivity paradox is not really a contradiction. On one hand, the optimists, the people I just described, they're looking at current technology and they're saying, this is awesome. We've got some wonderful things in the pipeline. The pessimists are mostly looking at current GDP, current uh, uh, productivity statistics, and maybe the past 5, 10, 15 years, and saying, hey, things have not been that good recently. But it, when, I say, when I say it that way, it's clear they're talking about two different things, the, the past versus the future. Secondly, AI is what economists call a general purpose technology. And this phrase was mentioned a little bit yesterday. General purpose technologies like electricity have enormous payoffs because they spawn complementary innovations. Electricity not only is wonderful in its own right, but it led to the invention of the electric light bulb and electric motors. And electric motors give you the possibility to have refrigeration and air conditioning and now electric cars. So there's a whole set of follow-on inventions that can be made once you have one of these general purpose technologies. And most uh, economic historians would point to GPTs as the main driver of productivity growth and economic growth over time. But surprisingly, GPTs, even though they have these great benefits in the long run, in the short run, they could actually lower productivity and lower benefits. So how does that happen? Um, well, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But I just want to say that the current slowdown is not necessarily predictive of the future. We did a little study with Daniel Rock, and uh, we looked at how any one given year's productivity predicted the next year's productivity or the next 10 years' productivity. And as you can see from this scatter plot, there was almost no correlation between the two of them. So yes, we've had some disappointing productivity recently, but I wouldn't look at those statistics as a predictor. I would instead look at what the underlying technology is doing. So let me just um, wrap up by saying that I think that we need to use these technologies to change the way we do our work. We can't rely on the technologies by themselves to have the impact. Instead, the challenge now is to put those technologies to work to, for the managers, the economists, the policymakers to take advantage of these technologies. So instead of taking 10, 20, 30, or 40 years for the benefits to play out, we can instead have them happen a lot more rapidly. And the inclusive innovation challenge that, we, that Eric Schmidt mentioned yesterday is a good example of that, where we are recognizing and rewarding the companies and organizations that are taking amazing technologies and deploying them. If we can speed up the process of taking a GPT and putting it to work, we're going to raise productivity and living standards a lot faster than if we just uh, plow only on the technology side. So in summary, this paradox between the pessimists and the optimists is not really a paradox. I think it could be resolved by understanding that AI is a GPT. Artificial intelligence is a general purpose technology. They, are, they require some time consuming effort to restructure, to reinvent our organizations and really our whole society. If we do those things, we can realize the benefits but the benefits won't be automatic. And a big part of the goal of this conference is to inspire people to think about how to use these technologies to make the world better and not just assume that the technologies will do that by themselves. So with that, let me stop there and uh, introduce this first panel where we're going to dive into these issues a little bit more. And uh, Daron Asimoglu, who I think is over here, is, uh, is going to uh, lead that panel. Daron is uh, one of the, I think you could say, the leading economist looking at the economics of technical change and, and how it's affecting labor. And we're very lucky to have him here at MIT. And he's going to lead and moderate the discussion. And I'm going to turn it over to Daron to uh, introduce the rest of the panel. Daron, welcome. Thanks, Eric. Well, I'll actually go here for one second and then do the introductions. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, it's a great privilege for me to be here. You've already 
heard one full day of interesting thoughts and uh, a great opening from Eric, which sort of uh, uh, frames the questions. Uh, almost every technology ushers in uh, hopes and anxieties, uh, and uh, almost every new technology has important societal implications, but perhaps all of these are doubly, triply true for AI and robotics because of the huge promise of productivity and efficiency gains, but also unknown and potentially complex implications for the labor market. And, uh, <clears throat> and I think uh, uh, there is growing debate on these issues, as you've also got from Eric's uh, uh, introduction. I think one sh sort of drawback of the debate that you sometimes encounter is that it's, uh, it's, it's centered on dichotomies, in particular two dichotomies. One dichotomy is that you know, the productivity implications of uh, new technologies are going to be so amazing that we're going to be in a world that has no parallel in history, and then the other one is that there's nothing under the sun in terms of productivity. The other dichotomy is uh, that, uh, you know, again, there's nothing under the sun when it comes to the labor market implications of new technologies. It's exactly the same thing as we've experienced over the last 300 years versus this is going to spell the end of work uh, for humans as they get taken over by machines. And uh, as you might guess, the reality is in the gray areas rather than at the extremes of these dichotomies. And I can't think of a better panel to discuss these issues than uh, the one we have here. You've already met Eric who's been a uh, leading participant in these debates. And we have Bob Gordon from uh, Northwestern University, uh, whose work I'll say a few more words when I introduce him uh, with the specific questions. And also Joel McKeer, uh, uh, also from Northwestern University. Both Bob and Joel have uh, made uh, fundamental contributions to these, uh, to these issues. So I think you have a real treat coming. So I think let me get this started by giving it over to Eric. Uh, and, and the specific issue I think that Eric is going to talk about is, uh, is a continuation of uh, what he has already introduced. It's about the productivity implications. In particular, as you've already seen, and Eric will talk about, uh, where are the productivity gains? Thanks, Daron. So uh, yeah, Daron asked me to, uh, to continue on this particular thing, that the session is both about labor and productivity. But let me, let me go a little bit further, and uh, I'm uh, intimidated here by having Bob and Joel on the stage because uh, they have been doing so much research in this. So part of my talk is going to be kind of a, a pre-rebuttal to what I think they're going to say. Bob and I, Bob's one of my oldest, dearest friends, and we have been having a road show where we go around and talk about productivity and growth and the effects of new technologies. And uh, panels are always more fun when people don't always agree, and I think you'll find that we have some different perspectives on that. So I'm going to uh, give you my perspective on it, and we'll, then we'll hear from Bob and from Joel, and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, all dive in on that. Um, so let me uh, remind you about this uh, disappointing recent reality of what's happened with productivity, um, because I, I think um, that's one of the, the real concerns that we have around productivity is this, this last number here that's uh, a little, little slower than what we'd like to see, and there's a lot of concern as to whether we're going to be stuck there forever. And uh, one way to look at it um, is from a historical perspective. And if you look at what happened earlier with earlier GPTs like electricity, what you see is that although Thomas Edison and Tesla and all those guys made some amazing inventions with electricity, and they started telling people, hey, you should use this in your factories and elsewhere, um, there was this long period there from 1890 to the, around 1920 or so where you didn't see much productivity growth, despite this. I don't think anyone would deny that electricity is one of the most amazing technological inventions that we've had. And historians like Paul David at uh, Stanford and Oxford went and looked at the factories and tried to understand what was going on. And what they saw was that um, these factories when they electrified, they weren't really fundamentally changing the way they worked. Before electricity, they had uh, big steam engines or sometimes water wheels that powered the equipment through pulleys and crankshafts. And uh, that drove the machinery. And when they electrified, they went and took out the steam engine. Then they went and got the biggest electric motor they could find and put it right where the steam engine used to be, hooked up the same pulleys and crankshafts, and got back in business. Now, did that? fundamentally improve productivity? Not really. There wasn't much of a change. And even when they built entirely new factories, uh, 
the architects would take the blueprints, make a big X through where the steam engine used to be and write in the margin, put electric motor instead. They'd say, okay, my work is done. And they would build a new factory based on the old designs. Again, not a big improvement in productivity. It took about 20, 30 years until you started seeing a new kind of factory. And the new factories were based on a different model where electricity uh, was used to power small electric motors that were spread out and distributed through the factory, not just one cooked by pulleys and crankshafts. And instead of having them, um, the machinery all clustered around that central power source, you were able to have different machines laid out in the sequence of production, the order of production. And that assembly line approach and uh, having the flow of materials go through the factory that did lead to big improvements in productivity. In the factories that Paul David looked at, there was not just 10 or 20 percent improvements, there was 100 percent, 200 percent improvement in productivity. And that's what you start seeing here in the 20s as part of that is this productivity boom that we saw. But then eventually that sort of started petering out too, and you see it levels off again there in the 1930s or so. Um, why do I show you this? Because as Chad Severson has documented, and I just finished writing a paper with him, if you change the times at the top there to the current era, the red line is what's happening during the IT era. And you see that it, it kind of eerily matches up there. There was a slowdown, then there was this improvement that I described to you on the earlier slides in the 1990s and 2000s, and then again, a bit of a slowdown. So one of the things I wondered was like, okay, well, what happened with, with uh, the earlier era, with the previous wave? Did it keep petering out? Did that blue line continue to be flat and low? Well, as it turned out, it kind of popped up. In fact, in the late 30s and 40s, and then into the 50s and 60s, those were the best era ever of productivity growth. Um, in the late, uh, in the mid 30s, people were talking about secular stagnation the way they are now. They said well, there are no more good inventions, that there's nothing good to be invented. And the very next couple of decades were just enormously successful. Now, I'm not saying that that's, I guarantee that's going to happen again, but it does give you some pause that even when you when you have a slowdown, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the end of productivity growth. The big issue, as I mentioned earlier, is that co-invention is not easy. That if you have these technologies, it takes time to reinvent your business processes. These factories that uh, evolved from the new technology um, took a lot of business process reorganization. Mona talked about this yesterday. And it's not very sexy, but it's a lot of work. And in other work I did, there's up to five to 10 times more dollars, time, and effort spent on the co-invention, the business process redesign, as is spent on the underlying technologies themselves. When someone installs a big ERP system or another big technology system, um, those of you who have done it, you know that it can cost hundreds of millions of dollars of time and effort to rethink your business processes. And the actual computers, the actual software, is a fraction of that cost. So that's what we're going through, not just at the organizational level, but really at the industry and societal level. So the expected productivity effects of IT, you can think of as not only having this core technology, but also a big investment in what I would call organizational capital, or intangible assets. And these intangible assets are not measured in our productivity statistics. They're not even measured as part of our capital stock even though in a way they are capital. When you re-engineer your business processes, you spend a lot of money up front in order to get a stream of benefits over five or 10 more years. That's like a capital asset, but it's an intangible capital asset. And if we don't measure it or if we mismeasure it, we are not capturing a big part of the way that the technology changes the economy. Um, now, you can do this more formally, and since you're at MIT, I thought you should see at least one equation here. It's even got a Greek letter, so you can officially check that off there. Um, but this is the way that we would model what's going on there. The first set of terms there is the traditional solo growth accounting model that Bob Solo here at MIT got a, a Nobel Prize for. But there are some additional terms uh, that have to do with what happens when you have an intangible asset, like the organizational capital associated with AI, that isn't properly measured. And if it's not properly measured, you're missing a big component of economic growth and a big part of what's driving it. And rather than go through the, the equation, I'll just show it to you graphically. There's this remarkable J-curve that can happen where 
even though this technology is helping the economy, the way you measure it, and, and, and what's really happening there is a, a growth almost uh, immediately in terms of true output. But if you're not counting the contri contribution of the intangible assets, you initially have a downward effect on uh, measured productivity. And the intuition there is that a bunch of people are working very hard to invest in organizational change. And that organizational change is going to have payoffs over time. At least they believe it's going to have payoffs. But it doesn't happen instantaneously. And the productivity statistics will show a bunch of people working really hard. There's $80 billion of investment in rethinking self-driving cars, for instance. There aren't a whole lot of actual self-driving cars on the road. So it looks like more input no increase in output. It looks like lower productivity when, in fact, that's an investment for future productivity growth. Eventually, the statistics catch up. When those self-driving cars, when that reorganization creates real benefits, you see higher productivity growth. But in the, in the short term, you can be fooled by investments that don't have an immediate payoff. The last thing I want to say is that although I focused on productivity here, I also want to stress we're going to talk about labor that productivity is important, but unlike what Paul Krugman says, I don't think it's everything. Um, you can have increase in output per hour without a big increase in median family income. And so we need to work not only on proving, making the blue line grow faster, but also think about getting that red line, the income that goes to the average person, more widely shared with the rest of us. So let me leave it there and turn it over to, uh, to Bob. Thank you. Well, I think that's a great segue for us because uh, Bob is going to talk about uh, both of those lines. Uh, Bob Gordon has been working on macroeconomics, employment, and productivity for several decades, but most recently he's written uh, a uh, masterpiece on uh, the history of uh, American productivity, pointing out that uh, uh, essentially the puzzles that Eric started with and, uh, and, and why the past had uh, such amazing productivity growth, but the future might be somewhat different. But uh, now, today, I, I guess Bob is going to talk about something a little bit more optimistic about the labor market. I'm always <clears throat> optimistic about the labor market. We've had more than two centuries of one technological change after another, and none of them have created mass unemployment. We understand what happened in the Great Depression. That was a failure of monetary and fiscal policy. Look what a decade of low interest rates have brought us to. We have 4.2% unemployment. We're well on our way to unemployment below 4%, uh, perhaps exceeding the level that was reached back in the 1960s. We've created 16 million new jobs since 2009. And uh, in labor markets, we have this enormous churn. We have 6.1 million job openings in August. We've got 5.2 million people hired, uh, 5.4 million people hired, 5.2 million separations, of which 3.2 million are voluntary quits. So people, jobs are constantly being destroyed, but jobs are constantly being created, and they're being created in greater numbers than they're being destroyed. What we've got now is actually a shortage of workers, not a shortage of jobs, in all sorts of parts of the economy. So should we be concerned about the quantity of jobs? No. Should we be concerned about the quality of jobs? Yes, and that's nothing new. Uh, we've been concerned about labor market polarization, thanks in part to the work of Darren's colleague, David Otter, um, for 15 years or so, the hollowing out in the middle, uh, the fact that the job growth has been at the top and has been at the bottom. Uh, we've been talking about rising inequality, the failure of median income to keep up with average income. We've been talking about that for the last 40 years. And for more than 40 years, we've been talking, this is a, a basic ingredient in many macro textbooks, uh, the mismatch of jobs and workers by skills and by location, and the low pay for unskilled workers, lower in the United States than it is in many European countries. And now we've got a new concern that labor share of national income has been declining. Uh, so all of these things are familiar, having nothing to do with artificial intelligence, but things that go back much further. What is surprising, and I was very surprised to find this out, if you take a given wage distribution across occupations and apply it to 2006 employment and 2016 employment, the average quality of jobs measured by their wages has actually increased slightly. It's not true that all we're creating is lousy, low-skilled jobs. 
So what's new about AI and robots? The first industrial robot was introduced by General Motors in 1961, and they were plentiful by 1995. In automobile factories, uh, those of us at the NBER took tours and saw robots welding together auto bodies, and they'd taken over the paint shop by then. Mainly in manufacturing, there are a few robots in Amazon warehouses, but so far we've seen very little uh, introduction of robots in education or in healthcare, except for uh, laser-guided surgery. Amazon's warehouses uh, suggest how uh, robots so far are limited. They bring great shelves to the human worker. The human worker actually still does the picking of the item and the packing of the item. AI has been traced back to 1957. It's now 20 years since uh, Deep Blue, an IBM machine, beat Gary Kasparov in chess. Uh, it's been six years since IBM's Watson uh, won at Jeopardy. So uh, AI has been around for quite a while. And what does AI involve besides games? Well, there are lots of things. Every time you go to an airline or hotel reservation system and make a booking, and it figures out to charge you a different fare than some other customer, that's smart. That's AI. And it's taken away most of the jobs of travel agents. Voice recognition and language translation have taken away some, but not all, jobs of transcribers and translators. Computer phone menus have taken away increasingly number of jobs of customer service agents. Barcode scanning has not eliminated jobs of cashiers and checkout clerks. Computerized radiology scans have not eliminated the job of radiologists, who still, even though the computer improves their diagnosis, still have to sign off on the diagnosis. Most spending on AI is in marketing. One firm trying to take customers away from other firms by analyzing lots of big data. And that's a zero-sum game. I asked my colleague Phil Kotler, the guru of marketing, uh, the other day, has AI and marketing taken away jobs in marketing? And he says, no, it's created more analyst jobs in marketing. A year or so ago, McKinsey Quarterly did a survey of 350 business firms and asked them, if you look at big data and advanced analytics, how much of it has changed your revenue or your costs? And three quarters of them said that it had cut costs or raised revenue by less than 1%. So that's where we are with AI. Now, I've got three graphs to show you that suggest that we're not on the verge of disappearing employment. Here, going back to 1970, is a graph with the big thick line showing the advance of ATM machines from zero to 400,000. The thinner line shows you what's happened to the employment of bank tellers. It's gone from 200,000 to 400,000. Bank tellers were not eliminated by ATMs. Now, here's a more recent chart about the retail sector going back to 2008. The lower line is bricks and mortar retailing. You'd think that's been decimated by e-commerce. Yes, it was decimated by the Great Recession, but it's come back. And the total job loss has only been 200,000 since 2008, while 400,000 jobs have been created in e-commerce. So on balance in retailing, we're ahead. We're not behind. <clears throat> and the last chart I think is the most interesting. This shows, in the, by the vertical lines, going back to 1970, shows when the first spreadsheets were invented for the personal computer. VisiCal, Lotus 1, 2, 3, and then Microsoft's Excel. And the line that goes down shows you that about a million jobs of bookkeepers and clerks were eliminated by the invention of spreadsheets. But spreadsheets made possible a whole new career called financial analyst. And the steeply rising line shows you about a million and a half new jobs were made possible. My moral of, from this is that it's very easy to predict jobs to be destroyed. Eric is very happy to predict that in the next 10 years or 15 years, we're going to eliminate all the jobs of long distance truck drivers. Um, so that's easy to predict. It's much harder to predict the new jobs that will be made possible by new technologies, like in this case, the financial analysts. So, in conclusion, my horizon only looks forward 20 years or so. I would not deign to predict what the world is going to look like 
in 50 or 100 years. AI will indeed displace some jobs, adding to labor market churn, but many jobs are being created, and monetary and fiscal policy have the ability to create as many as we need for the labor force. The spreadsheet example is pervasive. It's easy to predict job destruction, but much more taxing to the imagination to predict which jobs will be created. And finally, AI is nothing new, and its evolution over the past decade has been accompanied, particularly since 2010, by the slowest consecutive seven years of productivity growth in the history of the United States. Thank you. Well, it's my absolute delight to introduce Joel Mukir. Uh, I go a long time with Joel. I knew him before even we met because I was greatly influenced by his books on the British Industrial Revolution and the Levers of Riches. And then since uh, I'm happy to say we've become good friends and Joel has continued to be very productive in thinking about the history of industrialization and technology, but more recently turning his attention to the future of technology and the labor market. And uh, I guess, uh, uh, Joel is much more optimistic about productivity, but possibly agrees with Bob about uh, the labor market. Well, so it's a real treat to hear Bob and Joel agree. Uh, Bob and I basically disagree on many things, but you will actually see that we didn't coordinate these talks, although we have office almost next to one another, but you'll see that we're going to say very similar things. So where I disagree with Bob, of course, is that I think that the space of technological change will not only continue as it has in the past 150 years, but it will actually accelerate. So I'm willing to, to defend that to the death, but uh, not here in my seven minutes. Question is, what will happen to work? Uh, and is there a chance that we will actually see technological unemployment, and is there a real possibility that people will be reduced to these bored and vapid drones that people like Yuval Harari and others uh, are describing to us, you know, the, the classic statement of this is still, uh, I think, Kurt Vonnegut's uh, player piano, which is kind of a science fiction model. So as an economic historian, my knee-jerk reaction is, God, we've seen this movie before, you know. In the past, this has happened many times, and so workers resisted uh, technological change. So this is the best-known case. Of course, these are the Luddites in Nottingham. Uh, this is early in the Industrial Revolution, and they're breaking these machines because they think they're going to displace them. Uh, now, this tu they turned out to be wrong in the sense that technological unemployment basically didn't happen. Their sons and daughters of the people who were displaced by these machines, these were n framework knitters, handloom weavers. So they found other jobs that were, weren't really imaginable in 1825. Say, they became railroad engineers, electricians, you know, telegraph operators, and on and on and on. Or they migrated to the United States. So in the United States, too, things went very different. Here are you know, the number of people employed in agriculture, you see the first left column, you know, in the beginning of the nation, you know, three quarters of the labor force were farmers, and in 2000, you know, well, around 2%. So clearly, what happened to all these people? Well, you know, the U.S. economy did not collapse, and the streets went filled with these unemployed and unemployable ex-farmers, uh, except perhaps for the Great Depression, as Bob mentioned, but that was a different story. And so far, then, historically, there is very little evidence of technological unemployment, despite the fact that technological change has been very rapid. And you know, the, the reasons are very well understood. First is the, the growth of services, not so much manufacturing. Uh, second, the appearance of uh, new goods and services. And third, and that's what I want to dwell on a little bit, because it was, this process was relatively slow, and I think it is now accelerating. So maybe, just maybe, this time it's really different. And many people have expressed concern, including Eric, of course, here, but many people, some of them economists, but some of them, of course, uh, from other fields. So I'm going to make a few observations about that. Uh, the first is, and maybe I'll just go to the second paragraph, is that we should make a distinction between what we call process and product innovation. So process innovation, pure process innovation, is basically making stuff with less labor and less capital, and that's sort of the classic total factor productivity growth. Uh, but product innovation means the appearance of entirely new products and services that didn't exist before. And it's very hard to judge these, whether they're labor saving or capital saving. Uh, but what it does is it creates new jobs that nobody imagined before. And say in 1914, 
you know, people are worried about this, but who would have known that their grandchildren would have jobs like cybersecurity specialists or GPS programmers or veterinary psychiatrists? You know, all these jobs exist today. And, you know, nobody in 1914 would have even imagined that they could exist. And so, as Bob said, new jobs will be created, but we don't actually know what they are. But, you know, we can make some guesses. One of them, of course, which we can predict with fair certainty, is that the aging of the population will continue. And so geriatric services and things related with, with old people uh, will clearly require uh, more work. And I think that's where me mechanization will be particularly, of course, difficult, or some attempts in that direction. Uh, it's also quite clear that fertility will remain low. And that actually may create more jobs because because people have fewer children, they will invest more in their education, sort of the standard quality quantity trade-off. And so the more, you, a better education you want for your children, the more labor intensive you want it to be. And I also think, much like Bob, that it's unlikely that even so AI is, I think, progressing at a breathtaking rate, particularly the last five years since the perfection of, of, of machine learning. Uh, it's not clear that intelligence is all that counts in create creativity. So I have these three other I's here, intuition, instincts, and imagination. And uh, we should never underestimate what we call task knowledge, knowledge that we have but we can't express in words, and therefore we can presumably put it in, in an algorithm. So can machine learning learn to be intuitive, instinctive, and imaginative? And if not, the idea that labor and AI will be complements rather than substitutes, I think, uh, uh, becomes very convincing. What we do know is that, of course, this will not be painless. It's always painful. Uh, because people who are made redundant in one occupation cannot switch easily to another sector, and, that's, and, and so there will be pain. There was pain in the past, and there will be pain in the present. But let's just do a worst-case analysis, okay? Just uh, let me uh, bear with me for a minute. Suppose that in the long run, the doomsayers are right, and that in the long run, AI is so effective and other technologies that the demand for labor is sim simply uh, falls behind um, uh, uh, the supply, sorry, this is wrong. The, the supply of labor remains uh, higher than the demand for labor because the demand for labor declines due to uh, mechanization. How much then will people work? And what I'd like to submit to you is that the boundaries between work and leisure for many in the last, say, generation have become fuzzy. Uh, here's a factoid. 25% of all Americans do some volunteer work. They work, but they're not paid. Um, that seems to be an interesting observation. I mean, this is, they're supposed to be enjoying leisure, but they're actually uh, working. So if people, but if people don't work, what will they do? And here's something to think about. The most remarkable progress in technology in the last 50 years has been in leisure, okay? The, the improvement in the options and the quality of things that we can do at our leisure time have increased enormously. There's even a recent paper by Eric Hurst and colleagues who point out that the decline in, in, in male labor force participation uh, is largely due to these kids being hooked on video games. In other words, they cho choose leisure for income largely because the technology of enjoying leisure has become so good. And then wait until virtual reality becomes widespread. It's going to get worse. But even before the 20th century, I submit to you, uh, a life of leisure doesn't seem to be particularly bad. I know of no cases in which a British lord demanded to take a shovel and spend eight hours in the field digging up potatoes. Vasily Leontiev, the Nobel Prize winner, wrote a famous uh, essay about this, basically makes the same point. He says, those who ask what the average working man and woman would do with so much free time, forget that in Victorian England, the upper classes did not seem to have been demoralized by their idleness, blah, 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 blah. And the same, of course, was true for leisure classes anywhere we look at, whether they were Chinese mandarins or Roman generals. And John Maynard Keynes, in his famous essay that I thought would have already been cited, but I'm told it's not. So he wrote this 1930 essay called Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. And what he's saying is basically what I'm saying, which is it may well be that unemployment could be caused by technology. I mean, he was living after, this is written in 1930. But he says, all this means that in the long run, Mankind is solving its economic problem, I bold it. Economic problem basically means in the sweat of thy brow thou shalt eat bread. And we're solving that. We were able to eat without working very much. And then he says, for the first time since his creation, man will be faced, this is obviously 
you know, not gender neutral language writing in 1930, is a real and permanent problem. How to use the freedom from pressing economic care? And on and on and on, okay? So in, we, what we may well reach, ladies and gentlemen, in the long run, is that what we will call work will be undistinguishable from leisure, like college professors today, only uh, they will not get paid. And in the limit, only those who will want to work will do so. Now this may require a radical new approach to economics and specific to the distribution of income, because if people don't work, they've got to have a, uh, make a living somehow. And so the question, and I'm going to finish with that, if this techno-optimist scenario holds up, will this new world be utopian or dystopian? And I want to draw an analogy here, because technology is like a windfall, right? it's like discovering a resource. And so this windfall can be treated in different ways. Society can treat it like Norway and Canada have and become a progressive welfare state in which most people share in the blessings, or they become like Russia or Nigeria, where their revenues are stashed away for the benefit of a small kleptocratic uh, oligarchy. And that becomes a question of political institutions, not of technology. Thank you. Well, obviously, uh, as you might have expected, Joel, Bob, and Eric have uh, given us a lot of food for thought. I want to just say a few words before uh, turning it to the uh, panel for uh, them to have an opportunity to respond uh, to others' comments and, and, and add uh, some, some thoughts, and then we'll open it up for discussion. Uh, I think, uh, you know, one thing to sort of say, perhaps to put a little bit of this discussion into perspective, but emphasize a few other things uh, in the process, is that the common theme you are seeing emerge here is that we have to think of technology as doing many things and creating multiple types of responses. I think there is very little disagreement between Eric, Bob, and uh, Joel that there will be technologies that displace workers in the short run or from a subset of tasks. In fact, a lot of the, the technological progress throughout ages, and certainly for robotics and AI, is of that form. Once you can perform some tasks more cheaply using machines, if you're going to produce the same amount of uh, output, you would need less labor. Now, that's where economics comes in. We don't produce the same amount of labor. We will do, sorry, we won't produce the same amount of output. We will do many different things. One of the things we will do is we'll increase the amount of output that we produce, and that means that there's gonna be a productivity effect. We might want to start employing workers that were displaced from production into producing more of other things. And that's where the complementarities that Joel, for example, hinted at and Bob was implicitly talking about come in. We're gonna create new tasks, new occupations, new possibilities. But this also highlights that we have a huge amount from, uh, to learn from history, as, as, uh, as Joel sort of mentioned, because the same sorts of displacement followed by expansion of output, creation of new tasks, new occupations, new industries has been going on throughout history. But perhaps uh, if I may add one issue to this for the uh, panelists to think more and respond to is that, uh, you know, my reading is that every historical episode is different because the balance of the productivity effect which leads to expansion is different and the balance of new tasks that are created in the process are different. And uh, even though uh, Joel is absolutely right and Bob is absolutely right that we've done quite well at the end of many of these uh, episodes of arrival and spread of new technologies, there were several decades, sometimes even uh, more, of hardship for labor, certain specific classes of laborers, or perhaps even all laborers. So I learned from uh, Joel's book when I was a graduate student about what wages, ha what happened to wages during the Industrial Revolution. More recently, uh, the economic historian, Joel's good friend and my good friend, Bob Allen, called this Engels Pose, because there's about an 80 year period in which there was no wage growth whatsoever in, uh, during the Industrial Revolution, while 
a bewildering array of new machines were being invented and were coming online. So I think the episode of the Industrial Revolution in terms of how long it took for wages to increase versus, say, perhaps electricity, where it was faster, its devil is all, all in the details. So that's why I think we need to understand what AI robotics are doing and what the institutional structure and the education system are setting the scene in order to facilitate the transformation of work. So with this, I'll pass it to Eric, whose uh, uh, work has emphasized very different themes than the, perhaps the, the ones that Bob and Joel have talked about. So I think he has a useful uh, comeback at this point. Well, first I want to say there's so much I agree with from what Bob and Joel and, and, and Daron just said. Um, and I could reiterate that, but I think it'll be more interesting for all of us if I focus on the parts where we, where we disagree. And it, I'm going to pick up very much with my MIT colleague here and, and maybe disagree with my Northwestern colleagues on a couple of things. I mean, first, as Jerome was saying, every time is different. And I could easily, when, when Joel and, and Bob point to this historical evidence, I can say, well, wait a minute. You know, these new technologies are affecting a whole set, different set of tasks, and we can't assume that everything's going to play out the same. I talked yesterday about Polanyi's paradox and the potential of these machines to solve problems that we don't even know how to describe ourselves. But that would be too easy, so I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to say this time is different. I'm going to take them on in their own terms, talk about history. And first, I want to reiterate what, 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 what Daron just said, that um, yes, Joel said that eventually um, things worked out, and eventually there were, were, were jobs from. But but he did he did he, he was a, an honest historian. He, he used the word eventually because he knows that there was a long period where a lot of people didn't do so well. That there was real suffering. You just, you can read history or you can read Charles Dickens to see some of those conditions. And I showed you a chart more recently. This is not just ancient history. More recently, median income has been stagnating in the United States by every every metric, and it's not just economic measures. You can look at, at uh, opiate abuse or um, suicide levels, what uh, uh, Ann Case and her uh, economist husband, um, uh, Angus Deaton, described deaths from despair. They have just been soaring. In, in our next panel, we're going to talk about some of the struggles in, in Appalachia that um, are part driven by changes in, in the economy. Um, so part of it is that just looking at history, it wasn't necessarily all, all roses along the way. But the more fundamental thing is, is a philosophical mindset. And I don't even think the right question is, is this going to work out or isn't it going to work out? It's not something we sit back and watch and see what, what the technology does to us. The technology is a tool. And as I described in, in my talk, you can deploy it in lots of different ways. And there's a lot of work. Going back to the 1800s, one of the reasons that it did work out is the United States made massive investments in primary education. It led the world and had the most educated workforce. And that led to not just higher growth, but also more equality. We made a lot of conscious decisions. It wasn't the market that did that. That was decisions by us as a society, as policymakers. And again, if we want these things to work out, and I'm optimistic that they can work out, we have to be at the driver's wheel and think about how we're going to drive those kinds of changes and not ask, is this going to work out? But rather, what can we do to make sure it does work out? Wonderful, Eric. Thank you. So I'm going to pass it to Bob and Joel for very brief comments so that we can have a few questions from the can audience I, also. Can Joel I wants to jump I, in. I just want to respond to the historical points that, that Eric made, which I don't disagree with. Uh, I do want to point out that, in fact, in that sense, it's different now. And the reason it's different is because when the Industrial Revolution was taking place, not only that Britain didn't have a welfare state, they, what little they had of it, they dismantled in 1834 when they abolished the old Poor Law Act. We, in the 20th century, and when I say we, I mean the industrialized you know, Western world, we have something called the welfare state. The welfare state it was designed to be a safety net for people who that, that, that Eric is describing. Now, if we are going to go on dismantling the welfare state just as we need it most, OK, then we will be in serious trouble. And there's some evidence that that is, in the United States, uh, what we're in the process of doing. That could be just about the stupidest thing we can do. Uh, the welfare state is needed. And it is needed precisely because it can soften the very painful, what economists call, transitional dynamics that Eric talked about, which nobody in his right mind would deny. But that's exactly why I gave you the analogy. You know, we can do this the way Canada and Norway are doing this, or we can do this the way you know, other countries are doing this. And that will make all the difference. Let me, let me come in on, on several of these points. 
First of all, to pick up on Joel, we have deaths of despair. We have all sorts of disappointed people in the United States. But if you look at labor market institutions in Germany, Denmark, Sweden, they do not have a like uh, yeah. set of despair. Uh, mortality is improving instead of getting worse. And so you have to start asking, what do they have in Germany and Scandinavia that we don't? A whole set of institutions, labor unions, uh, government guaranteed medical care, and a lot of other things. On Eric, I wish you would stop uh, telling us about productivity rising in the 1920s and slowing down in the 1930s. As a macroeconomist, I bristle at any attempt to uh, liken the Great Depression with what happened after the 1990s when you lay those two decades uh, on top of each other. Um, and on Joel, about Keynes and the future of leisure in 15-hour weeks, uh, we know from Europe that um, modern societies do not choose to take their leisure in the form of shorter work weeks. They choose to take it at more weeks per year in vacation. And so if we're going to go anywhere in the United States, it's to copy our European brethren in, having, uh, in taking the whole month of August off. <laughs> Thank you. I think uh, Unlike academics who get the whole summer off. <laughs> we have a few minutes for, uh, for questions. Uh, if nobody volunteers, I certainly have my own. But uh, Hi, yes. um, um, thank you. I'm Enrique with the uh, Office of Digital Learning here at MIT. If this were a joint session of Congress, um, what would be the specific recommendations based on policies that you would need to enact to ensure that that future that you mentioned actually arrives? So I, I, think, I think it's a great question. And, and I think we've all written about this and talked about it. And, and I refer you to, to some of our writings. Like in the second machine age, we have three chapters um, devoted to this. But let me very briefly touch on on three that, that to, to, to highlight. First off, I, I, most economists, and maybe we'll hear maybe from David Otter later today, would put education at or near the top of the list. Um, we are not in a world where machines can do everything. There's still so many tasks, as, as, as Joel and Bob and, and, and Jerome point out, that only humans can do. And there is often a skill mismatch. And we can do a much better job of reinventing education. And I think just plain investing more in education to focus more on creativity, to focus on interpersonal skills, teamwork. And there, those are the kinds of things that we're going to be needing more of um, going forward. So we can say a lot more about reinventing education, but that's the first thing on the list. The second thing is I would actually do more to boost entrepreneurship and business dynamism. Um, we hear a lot about the amazing things in Silicon Valley and elsewhere, but the data are surprisingly disappointing in terms of overall uh, entrepreneurship in the country as a whole. In a capitalist system like ours, uh, more or less, we have a group of people who are designed, who are charged with coming up with new products, new services, and new jobs. We call them entrepreneurs. And too often, government is trying to protect the past from the future, tr trying to uh, preserve old jobs and old incumbents rather than embracing new ones. We could do a lot more of that. And last but not least, as, uh, as Joel was pointing out, we need to make sure we have a safety net, a, a tax and transfer system, redistribution system. My own favorite is the earned income tax credit, which in not only gives people uh, 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 income support, but also encourages them to stay engaged in the labor force, because there's so much work that needs to be done. And I think people get a sense of, of value from being contributors to society. So those three things, education, entrepreneurship, and, and re redistribution, I think, would help go a long way. I would add a fourth, if I may, and that is a lot of the high-tech sector. I'm not telling anything that you don't know. In this country, depends on immigration. And the one thing that the government seems to be turning away from is realizing that this is how you build a place like Silicon Valley. Okay? You bring in the Israelis, you bring in the Indians, you bring in the Turks, you bring in people from all over the world. They want to come here. We should accept them with open arms. The idea of starting to... To, to restrain that strikes me as totally cockamamie. And I would say this in a joint session of Congress. So we okay. have two more. <clears throat> we have two more questions. So let me, let me take the two questions at once, and then we have one minute for us to, uh, to react to them. Please. Okay. OK, I have a quick question. OK, uh, it, it's great that the panels mentioned the productivity, AI, employment. But one thing I think uh, you didn't mention is the technology enabled the product, productivity and employ, employment across the border. OK, so what happened to the distribution of productivity across the border? Is this something uh, to do with globalization? What do you think about that? OK, and then the final question, please. Um, yeah, I wanted to bring up 
a couple of historical factors that I didn't hear about in the presentations, and I want to hear your, your thoughts. And the first is about um, the growth of consumption over the course of the 20th century, which some people argue is what kept employment high. And of course, now there's an argument that we kept, can't keep going down this path. We can't keep consuming ever more to keep employment full because we've reached the ecological limits of that. That's the first one. The second one is the organized and often incredibly violent and bloody fight for shorter working hours that happened you know, at the end of the 19th century, which, again, some versions of labor history would argue is how workers started getting an increasing um, share of profits in an age of rapid technological change. Obviously, we're not having an organized, bloody fight for shorter working hours. OK, now. that's wonderful. That's our two other good points. So I think in the remaining minus 30 seconds for our <laughs> panelists, we have globalization, the future of consumption, and the conflict between labor and capital. Take it away. <laughs> <coughs> You want? I, I just wanted to, uh, first of all, second Joel's policy uh, recommendation of much more high-skilled immigration. Uh, Trump wants to cut legal immigration from a million to 500,000. I think we should go in the direction of Canada, which brings in three times as large a share of its population as we do. And another thing, uh, preschool education for the poverty population. Those young kids that have an enormous vocabulary gap from middle class kids need help to avoid this kind of uh, stagnation and lack of income mobility in this country. Uh, so those are a couple of more uh, policy suggestions for me. And, and let me just hit on both questions very quickly. On, on the globalization, absolutely, this is going to hit many other countries, I think, even harder than what's hit, hitting the United States. Michael Spence and, and Andrew McAfee and I have an article where we talk about um, how some of those jobs that are very routine that are being done in other countries are even more in the bullseye of some of these new technologies. On the, uh, on the, uh, the second question, I would say we need to rethink our economic metrics. Uh, GDP is a very, it was a great invention in the 1930s, uh, and maybe some people call it one of the greatest inventions of the 20th century, um, but we need to move beyond that and think about things that aren't based on more flat screen TVs or more traditional consumption. There are other ways that we can increase well-being, and including the environment and including the value of all the free things we do is part of it. It's a research project we're also doing here at the MIT Initiative. But if we don't have the right metrics, we're not going to be pointed in the right direction. Well, thank just, you very just, much. Just one note on consumption. And that is the pessimistic views about what is happening to median income, real wages, and similar things are all suffer from the same flaw. And that is they are all real, meaning they are deflated by a price index. Now, suppose, suppose that that price index was constantly erroneous in the sense that it overmeasures inflation simply because it's unable to correct for the constant quality improvement of goods. That actually means that much of what our, we're worried about is, as far as me, median income is concerned may be the result in part of mismeasurement. Well, thank here, here. you very much. Uh, I think uh, we've got a lot of food for thought. And uh, you know, despite the fact that you've heard very different uh, perspectives, and uh, if you have uh, interacted with Joel, Bob, and Eric uh, as many times as I have, you know that there is a lot more uh, thoughtful background to some of these disagreements. But also, it's remarkable there is how much agreement on some of the very important themes. And the one that I'll just leave you with is that the way that I to often put it is that there's a huge institutions technology mismatch here. We have tremendous changes, but it's not clear whether the institutions, especially in the United States as we have in the education sector, in fiscal system, in social welfare, are actually up to enabling us to make the best out of them. Thank you. to uh, introduce